Welcome once again to the Jazz Violin Podcast. This is episode two, and today we're chatting with Chris Garrick. Um, Chris is one of my favorite jazz violinists, um, and he happens to be uh, based in the UK. Actually, Edinburgh, which is where I grew up. Um, We chatted today uh, just outside of London, had a chat about a number of things, mainly music, uh, a little bit about practice, about a bit about his upbringing and how he got into playing and um, we also chatted a little bit about his cooking and just um, his outlook on life in general um, yeah okay hope you enjoy We were doing in tune. What are you talking about? We were, we were just on in tune. That show it's on every day, Drive Time. Okay. Talking about a new album that we've got with um, Jackie Gankworth and David Gordon. What ben, is that? Ben Davis. What, what's going on with that? It's called Butterfly's Wing, and it's a collection of songs and poetry <coughs> set to music by David. Mm-hmm. With a quartet, fiddle, cello, piano, and voice. Oh, wow. And it is very sort of unusual. Yeah. In its nature. And uh, I really like it. It's lovely. It's very, very subtle. Um, very, very delicate. Right. Jackie's voice is the sort of at the centre of things. And we, it's Ben and I. You know Ben Davis? He set up that band, no. Basquet Strings, a few years ago. So, ben Davis, does he play cello? Yeah. Yeah. The Mercury Prize nominated okay. thing a few years ago with Seb Rochford and people like that. All right. Is he that crew? He's an amazing improviser on the cello. Cool. But uh, we sort of pep around the edges of Jackie's voice and Dave just sort of gives us a beautiful piano carpet underneath. Right. Is the album out? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I shall let you have a copy if you'd like to have a listen. Yeah, I've got to. one here, yeah. That'd be great. It's, very, it's, just, it's a little different to yeah, well, the stuff I'm doing, anyway. But uh, So, like, chamber jazz? Well, that's a sort of... You could call it that, you know, nature of the line-up. There's no percussion. Right. And um, although I am caught sort of scraping the body of the fiddle now and again to get a little okay, bit of a bossa yeah. nova vibe. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So okay. I, I interject. No, no, <coughs> I mean, that's a you're just good about start. to hit me with a big question there. I think I was just going to start with the start, really. Just ask how you, how you started playing, really. I, Can you go from the beginning? Yeah. Well, I look at what I'm doing these days, playing the violin and enjoying it mostly. And I yeah. think, how on earth did I get here? Right. When I think back to when I was a kid, and I remember saying to my mum and dad, <clears throat> please, can I have a drum kit? I want to play the drums. That's really funny, yeah. And uh, they were like, where on earth would we put a drum kit in this house? There's already four pianos, a harpsichord, <laughs> electric organ, electric piano, yeah. um, a few trumpets, a few clarinets. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't anything, it, they, it wasn't. Uh, physically possible. Okay. So I ended up trying to play the drums a little bit at school, and they gave me a violin instead. So you started said, with drums. Well, it was an aspiration. Okay. I did. I did, I did start with violin, but my, I, I aspired more to the drums, and I, th- oh. I think uh, the reason for that is that I've always been really excited by rhythm and rhythmic things, okay, and yeah. rhythmic um, relationships. When yeah. musicians get together, it's really the rhythms, yeah. then the overlapping and the intertwining of rhythms that yeah. excite me, get me going. You know. When I hear great drummers play, I stop and stand in bewilderment and uh, still do to this day. Um, one of the first recordings I heard was uh, this wonderful group with a violin player in it, but also some drums called Shakti. Oh, yeah. John McLaughlin's yeah. band with the Indian guys and this guy El Shankar yeah. <coughs> sitting in the lotus position playing ridiculous yeah. violin. But it was a tabla playing as much as anybody of Zakir Hussein. Mm. Um, that got me excited. Is so, Zaka Hussein is still alive? I believe so. I went to a master class he did at the Edinburgh Festival not that long ago. Yeah. Um, and then I saw Shakti's revival 
thing a few years ago in France. I think it's still going strong, yeah. Mm. Um, and that was the first cassette I can remember Dad giving me um, when I was about five. On one side it had a bit of Shakti and a bit of Mahavishnu Orchestra. Yeah. And on the other side it had Stefan Grappelli and Django Reinhardt Hot Club France. Right. And so he gave me this cassette and I played it over and over and over again. And uh, so <clears throat> when I look at the sort of diverse schedule I've got these days, one minute doing something with electric violin, the next minute doing sort of swing, yeah. 30s style, and then doing a bit of gypsy music as well. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I started off with a quite eclectic, yeah. um, you know, listening experiences. And um, so I've always been interested, got interested in various different things, not stuck to one particular thing. Right, yeah. But I started um, violin when I was five um, at school with a peripatetic teacher there called Joan Penrose. Um, but I started music years and years before that, I guess, fetally. You know, right, yeah. Because mum and dad were both musicians. Mm -hmm. and so there was music going on all the time around me and my brothers. And dad played jazz piano, was a jazz composer. Um, and mum went to the Royal Academy of Music, studied singing and piano. And um, so one minute in this house with all the instruments everywhere, there might be Dad in one room transcribing some Duke Ellington <laughs> uh, off the record. And the other room, you'd turn and there'd be Mum practising some Marlowe or some, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, uh, sort of Finzi clarinet concerto or something. And so there was always... You know, <clears throat> and those formative years, of course, you're not thinking about it. It's just all going in, isn't it? It's yeah. like soaking it all up like a sponge. And, when I finally got to pick up the violin for the first time, it was the Suzuki method. Yeah. Did you Did you do that? No, I didn't. I uh, I uh, that um it, I I like the idea of it though. And the more I yeah. hear about it, the more I sort of wish I had done it because uh -huh. it does sound great. So right. What's it What's it about? Well, it's a, a very very a fun way for young kids to get interested in the instrument mm -hmm. because you have to build your violin. That's the first thing you have to do. To build oh really? It. Yeah. It, teacher sends you back and you to ask your mum and dad to help you build a violin find whatever you've got in the house and so mum emptied out a pack of cornflakes we got a box for the body yeah and um we found a ruler that made a good neck and then some sellotape yeah so that was the fiddle done wow and then for the bow um i think my teacher joan penrose has said what you need to do is get some string and a, a rubber hoop mm -hmm. like the ones you used to have in sports halls yeah or rubber hoop it's quite quite heavy, mm -hmm. and then you tie a piece of string to it, and mm -hmm. you hold the end of the string, and then you let it drop a, about a foot or two foot, mm -hmm. um, and then you sort of gently swing it like a pendulum, and right. that's your that was your bow, and ah. you, so you hold the, the your beautiful homemade violin in one hand, <laughs> and the bow, so no strings or anything like that, yeah. but it's just to get the feel of these um, yeah. two two things that you're going, soon going to be using for real, wow. just to get used to it. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that was the beginning of the Suzuki method, and I stayed with Joan um, until I was sort of 11 or 12, and then I started having some tuition from a wonderful guy up at uh, Hitchin called Bernard Blay, okay. who um, uh, was a big inspiration to me. And he was also a, he was a classical player actually, Bernard, but he he loved jazz music, so he was quite sympathetic to my okay. tendencies, oh, cool. crossing over all the time between the two. And then uh, I stayed with Bernard until I finished my grade eight, um, and which was, I was 15. And then I sort of took things off on my own. But going back to the early earlier time, uh, Dad would take us to gigs. Um, and so we, we would go and see him play with band, bands at places like Ronnie Scott's in the mid-70s and mm -hmm. be exposed to uh, all the excitement and, um, you know, atmosphere of a jazz club. Yeah. And, uh, the tender ages of three or four or five and mm -hmm. <clears throat> the next morning mum couldn't necessarily get a babysitter for us on a Saturday morning so she would take us down to her rehearsal which she was doing with the London Philharmonic Choir at the Festival Hall wow. and you'd be sitting there waiting for her finished rehearsal but while that while you were waiting she'd be rehearsing Messiaen's Francis of Assisi with a full choir and full LSLPO wow. you know in front of you and you were sort of so it was always mm -hmm activity and different events when I look back and I think I, I walked up to Oliver Messiaen when I was five with <laughs> my autograph book and just blithely said excuse me can I have your autograph wow. and he gave me I've got his autograph <laughs> interrupted his rehearsal uh, and to the next night I would be 
with uh, my brother Gabriel at Ronnie Scott's listening to Dad's man, waiting for him to finish so we could go home and go to bed. But sitting next to us might be someone like Petula Clark or, right. you know, or Cleo Lane or somebody yeah. like this. So you sort of brushing shoulders with people, not really thinking twice about it. Yeah, sure. So all this was going in and in and in. And um, I uh, was given tunes to learn by Dad. He would say, right, today we're going to learn a couple of jazz standards and also his a little original tune I've written for you. And so he'd write these down and then he would accompany me and I'd learn them. So, for example, I would learn tunes like Lady Be Good and Honeysuckle Rose, Limehouse Blues, these sort of mainstream standard tunes that we all play yeah. and everyone loves to hear from the age of five. And, and uh, on, alongside that, Joan Penrose on the classical side was giving me the sort of technical right. work. Yeah. And I was working through grades one, two, three, four, five with her at the same mm -hmm. time. Okay, yeah. And so I kind of look back and I think I got the, um, the, the, the strength to play via the traditional route uh -huh. and developing an, an okay technique. And on the other side of the, the camp were, was all this exotic, exoticism of yeah. jazz and rock and yeah. fusion and Indian music and um, everything mum was getting up to with the classical stuff. Well, did, you, did your mum play piano? She played piano as well as singing. Yeah, she's, singing. She's, she's been teaching piano peripatetically for a long time and still does oh, right. to this day, yeah. And clarinet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you would say that your dad was your first like jazz teacher, you think? Yeah, um, there's no denying it. Your parents are, they mould you. Yeah. Um, or they can mould you if they take, it depends how involved they are in what you're doing. But yeah. mum and dad were very, very um, involved it was a very, very um, fertile period for them as well. They yeah. were busy having a young family. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of three brothers living together in the house with all these instruments with, yeah. with mum and dad. And so there was a real kind of um, arrow of time. Yeah. There was a real momentum. Right. And we were all soaked up and wound up in all that. <clears throat> While I was growing up, there was a new jazz club opened in, in my hometown, Berkhamsted, mm -hmm. um, which uh, dad was, was heavily in, in, involved with when a local jazz fan found that he was living around the corner from him right, came yeah. and said, I can't believe this, your Michael Garrick, I've got yeah. your LPs going back to the early 60s with uh, Joe Harriet and Sean right, Keane yeah. and um, uh, the likes. And we've got to do something. You live here, there's nothing jazz going on here, so let's start the jazz club. So that happened, mm -hmm. and that's still going strong, that, that Berkhamster Jazz Club. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, we were just all swept up in the wave of what was going on in Dad's career and right, Mum's yeah. career at the time. Yeah, and so I have to say he was a you know the the only influence really, or right. mum to a slightly lesser degree, of course, because I'm now um, forging a career much more on the jazz side, the improvising side. But yeah, her influence was no less critical. Yeah, sure. um, she brought us up on a diet of Indian curry and yeah. um, you know love and yeah. energy, yeah. which. Uh, they still depend on to this day. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Indian curry is the diet of jazz musicians. Yeah. In, in England, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> They're always open late. <laughs> um, so would you, would you say that it was a positive thing, having musical family? Uh, certainly, yeah. yeah. Uh, at the time, I was very distracted, like you uh, could easily be as a young kid, by sport, girls, right, yeah. um, you know, drums, yeah. rock music. Uh, but but on the, by and large, Dad was you know however um, you know determined he was to get us to toe the line and you know practice enough so you could probably uh, maybe one day follow in his footsteps and go into music. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was he was pretty he was patient with us if we mm -hmm. were playing a bit truant and a bit naughty, you know, okay. which of course you do. You yeah, know, yeah. young kids growing up and um, went off the rails a couple of times, and I remember stopping playing the violin for about a six month period when I was 11 because it really just it, it was really opposed to everything I wanted to do at that time and mum and dad were cool about it they didn't really say no you must continue you know right. so they let me pause and and I looking back I know that they knew I would go back yeah to it they were just waiting for the day you know yeah. like, I remember thinking one day I I just see how this this feels. You know, it's about six months later. Yeah. Now I've had a little break from it, and I remember picking it up, thinking, I can actually still do this. It actually still feels all right. I haven't forgotten any of it. Yeah. I can still play. 
Um, and uh, then things accelerated a bit more, and I, I think I guess I started to enjoy it a little bit more. Okay. But still, I wasn't ever thinking, I'm going to do this forever. Oh, really? No, not at yeah. all. Until I went to the library at the age of 16. So this is after I finished my grade 8, and um, I was at that crossroads where you just finished school, and we, mm. you know, where, where are you going to go with your life 16. now? You, I just finished CSEs. Okay. It was the very last year of... CSEs before the GCSE came in. Okay. Um, also, I, I see things because because I grew up in Scotland. I always forget that. It's yeah. Just slightly different, slightly different ages way of doing it. Yeah. And I th so you're at crossroads. What, am I going to go to college? Am I going to go and get a job? What am I going to do? And I got a job at the local Waitrose stacking mm. shelves. Right. And at the same time, I went to the library out of curiosity to get some vinyl. Yeah. And I found something I'd never heard or come across to that point. Mm -hmm. um, this guy called Yasha Heifetz. Yeah. And uh, it's turned out to be um, it's quite a significant character yeah, in sure. the history of, of yeah. violin playing. Yeah, sure. This Russian guy, the most prolifically recorded, <coughs> recorded violinist there had been. Mm -hmm. and one of the most admired, perhaps the greatest ever. And yeah. I was like, oh my goodness, yeah. how, come, how come I've not come across him before? Anyway, I got all the records I could see that said high fits on them. Yeah. <clears throat> and I uh, took them back and started listening. And the first one was this concerto by Alexander Glazunov. Yeah. And still to this day one of my very favourite pieces. Not particularly popular piece, but it's through composed okay. concerto. It's wonderful, beautiful. Yeah. And this recording um, from 1938 or something okay. just hit me uh, like a ton of bricks. And it, I, I, I suddenly felt this huge uh, enthusiasm to try and emulate, right. if I could, this beautiful mm. um, way of playing music on the violin that I hadn't heard before. Yeah. Violin bef before that to me was Stefan Grappelli. It was um, sitting in a youth orchestra right, playing yeah. first or second violin parts yeah. for hand, hand organ symphonies. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. I hadn't really heard. Um, soloists. And nothing had struck me like that before. Right, okay. Well, I had heard soloists because I met Nigel Kennedy when I was about 10. Right. And um, we jammed together. Um, Johnny Dankworth, he um, arranged and sort of, sort of plotted to get Nigel and I to jam together, me the cool. young blonde sort of yeah. beginner, and uh, Nigel who had already finished his studies with Juilliard and had come back and got a record deal with EMI. How old, how old would he be then then? So. Oh, he would have been uh, about 24, 25. Right. Okay. Um, yes, he's about 15 years my senior. Right, yeah. Uh, and uh, we did this jam. I remember we played Crazy Rhythm together and we, yeah. we brought the house down. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway. We, I must have heard him play um, sort of his thing, classical violin, a few mm -hmm. times, but for some reason it was these Heifetz records that, that really struck me. And so it wasn't until I was 16 and I heard these Heifetz things that I thought, hang on a minute, I could um, get my head together finally and try to uh, sort of envisage yeah. some sort of musical career. Yeah. So the Waitrose job lasted five weeks yeah. and I sort of deliberately got the sack. Yeah. Yeah, by um, what they asked, that's not really very interesting, but yeah. it's just all about wastage, terrible what goes on behind the scenes at supermarkets. <laughs> uh, so uh, I got uh, <clears throat> I got shown the door there and well, sort you of contested willingly the went. Mm -hmm. What? You contested the wastage? Yeah, they, they had a carton of orange juice, one had split, and so the other 24 had to be spoiled, had to be oh, chucked right. out because the, they all got a bit sticky on the outside. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and so. I, I said, why don't we wash them and then put them back? Yeah. And I sort of started drinking it and st stealing them. Oh, no, you can't be doing that. Um, you know, terrible wastage at Waitrose. Yeah. But it's my favourite supermarket now. Yeah. No, I mean, but only if I have to. If it's not grown <laughs> at home, I'll go there. Um, so that was uh, a turning point. Yeah. Meeting, as, as it were, high fits. And, uh, and then I undertook the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto with the local youth orchestra. Wow. And... Um, um, I started doing gigs and we met up with um, the Hearts County Orchestra, mm -hmm. um, which is still very local to Berkhamsted, and uh, formed our first band, the first proper band playing jazz music with mm -hmm. um, now um, pianist down at Ronnie Scott's James Pearson. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
the amazing bass player John Noyce, who uh, played with people like since with Jethro Tull and right. with um, Gary Moore and so on. Yeah. Um, and the guitarist called Alan Simpson, and we called it Nobody's Quartet. Right. It's all very sort of English, and nobody thought that they could Leading. be the be the big leader. Yeah. And so we thought Nobody's Quartet. And um, then we sort of, I got down to the Academy of Music on the jazz course and uh, never really looked back. It was mm-hmm. it was meant to be from that point, but yeah. all that earlier time yeah. um, uh, was I uh, really sure. wasn't sure until I heard those high fits recordings. That's really funny because a lot. I think I imagine that's like really like the other way around to how a lot of people get into playing jazz because a lot of people, or even you know, they would probably be focused solely on classical music, and then. Mm. suddenly find a Grappelli record and go, oh man, oh. Well, I mean, this is how I did it anyway. Yeah. Well, that was Dad, you see, because of his jazz background. Yeah. And just to fill in a little uh, gap, maybe to explain why he was so determined, if possible, for us to f- follow into music, it's because he was really stopped as a kid. He, oh, right. he came up in a, in a relatively straight-laced yeah. um, family environment where um, he went for piano lessons but strictly on the classical side, mm-hmm. and his, his mum played piano. Um, and uh, jazz, the whole idea of doing anything jazz-wise was um, really frowned upon. And yeah, he, sure. he really had to battle to do what he loved when he heard yeah. jazz. He thought, no, I really want to mm-hmm. do this. But he didn't really have the opportunity till he'd been through his national service and he'd come back and he'd got mm-hmm. a job at the Met Office mm-hmm. in his early 20s. And it wasn't until his mid-20s, really, that he started to get the opportunity to establish himself as a as a musician in his own right and forge a career mm-hmm. so he really struggled and he want, I think he wanted to uh, his beginnings were difficult mm-hmm. um, but he so I think he wanted to ha- us to have the opposite experience yeah in a way he was uh, giving us the, yeah. the opportunity that he wish wished he'd had right yeah at such a young age I think. yeah and, and we sure got it yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, looking back, you know, this um, every we had every opportunity, and if I'd been in a different, maybe less um, uh, what, head in the clouds nature at the time, um, you know, wondering wondering too much about things, uh, maybe could have got going a bit sooner. But you know, no regrets. Tried lots of different um, things out, including working at the fairground, working at Waitrose. Yeah. Um, always loved cooking, actually, and I've always thought if. I wasn't in music. I might oh, really? be creative in the kitchen instead. Right. Yeah. 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 You say what you you cook a lot. I cook every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What sort of stuff do you like cooking? Everything depends yeah. what I what, what I fancy eating. Right. Okay. Anything. My wife and I are always uh, cooking up a, an idea for the next dinner. What should we? We'll plan ahead a week. You know. Oh so, really? Oh yeah. So if we're having friends over for next Sunday, I'll start making the, the stock for that sauce, you know, right. about four days ahead. So I'll go to the butcher and order my veal bones and right. um, what have you, and start right. planning. So is that like, you, you, you do a lot of cooking, that's like a hobby? Yeah, it's like planning for a gig. Yeah. I think about what I'm going to put in the set for a gig in a couple of weeks' time, you know, so I'm yeah. thinking about the ingredients that are going to go into yeah. a meal. A meal. Yeah. It's, an, it's an event in the same in the same way, you know, yeah. as, as music. I think music and food have more in common than people think of on a day, day, right. day-to-day basis. Yeah. And I really, really get sad when I see how much fast food and takeaway food and frozen food yeah. the world eats. Absolutely, When yeah. this fresh, wonderful produce yeah. on the doorstep, there's bay trees growing in bushes, wild everywhere, yeah. uh, to flavour your soups. You know, don't get me started. Yeah. Chives, mint, you know, rosemary, thyme, yeah. growing wild everywhere. Just for starters. Yeah. So yeah, I, I do love a bit of cook, cooking. Maybe one day I'll start a school, which is a combined food, yeah. food and music school yeah. for people who who want to get creative with music and food. Yeah. And yeah. Do a bit of both. Just mind you, don't cut your fingers. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> it does go quite well, even just like time-wise, you know, because because like a lot of people don't, probably don't have time to like do the you know i guess like you know do these like long long meals that take eight hours but if you're a musician sometimes you've got a whole day at home well precisely you can do your practice yeah make your stock let it boil or whatever yeah i like to um divide things up in 15 minutes all right going back to high fits um excuse me i got his uh biography i forget the guy's name who put it together but 
I took a really interesting thing from it about practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know this thing about practice, um, you know, uh, hours and hours and hours of practice that, that when you're young you tend to do and you, mm -hmm. and I did a bit of that and I kind of did a bit of damage to my technique and ah. got a bit of a strain in my neck, you know, just right, yeah. going over things too, too hard all the time without when, when was a, this, a break. Was this? I'm talking about, about that time, 16, 17 years, right. building up to doing this Mendelssohn performance. Yeah. And I was reading Heifetz's book, and there's this <clears throat> comment that he makes in there about practice. It's the same as music and e everything, actually. Exercise. Mm -hmm. um, it only works best if you uh, follow the three golden rules. Ooh, two secs. It just stopped. Don't stop. It started again. It? I, just, I just freaked out a little bit. Looks like it started again. I'm back in business. I think so. I can hear it again. I don't know what I'll do Where about it. Where did it cut out? It cut out. I think we were talking about um, the 15 minute, 15 minute. Yeah. Thing. Just so the, fif start again. the 15 minute chunks of time, um, and the way Heifetz expressed this was to do with attack, sustain, and release. Mm -hmm. So like a phrase, a bebop phrase. Okay. Attack, sustain, release. But you can do that. Yeah. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. And between, between times, there's breath, there's space, yeah. where there's time to listen. Mm -hmm. And the, the same thing applies to practice. Good practice is the same. Mm -hmm. So he, he advised 15-minute chunk of playing, mm -hmm. concentration, and then when it gets to the end of the 15 minutes, put the violin down, do something else for 15 minutes, relax. Oh, yeah. And I tried doing that, and it was just like a revelation. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No rush. Yeah. And you get twice as much, ten times much more work right. done that way. Yeah. If you give yourself a chance to rest between each effort, mm -hmm. rather than slamming up. Three, you must do three hours practice, right? No break, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of it, you kind of go, hmm, well, I've done it, but it didn't feel that good. You know, I feel yeah. a bit of strain in my hand, and, yeah. and um, I've still got to go over that, but it's not quite right. And so there's that thing of overworking something, you know, it's like mm -hmm. if you overwork the egg whites, you, you're gonna, the yeah. meringue's gonna, not, not, gonna, not gonna work out. And yeah. So there is a fine balance, and I think time and rest, um, those combined with work, time, rest, and work, so that's attack, sustain, release. <clears throat> that recipe worked really well for me, and I, and I tell people that I'm teaching that mm -hmm. now, and. <clears throat> If they're patient enough, they try it and they say, yeah, that really works. Cool. But, you know, of course, when you're young and you've got all the energy that you've got and uh, sure. um, burning inside you, it's, it's tough to be patient. I, yeah. I understand that. It's good that you got into that so young anyway, getting into that 16, 17. I think if I hadn't, you know, I'd, I've got physical difficulties as I think all violin players must, a little bit, a little mm -hmm. bit of tennis elbow, a little bit of a yeah. trapped nerve in my neck. Yeah. Um, but I've been lucky... That I did discover that thing. It's helped me not to get further truck difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To keep rest every every because it's a yeah a it twisted is, yeah. wound position, isn't it? Elbow totally. under. Especially, There's yeah. a lot of tension there. Yeah. So it's really important just to go yeah. floppy. Yeah. To help um, to sustain your career. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I might take that on board. <laughs> it's 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 because uh, it's, it's no effort to do it as yeah. well. It, it's, it's less effort. <clears throat> seems. Yeah. Exactly. It's less effort. Um, so yeah, well, when you, you always feel better when you come back to it, don't you? As well, like you, you know, yes. if you, I went away yeah. for two weeks and came back, and it just instantly feels yeah. it feels weird. But you're like, it, you know, everything feels great. Yeah, you know? and you feel refreshed in your mind as yeah. well, probably. Yeah, having gone and rested something for a bit. So I imagine these little fifteen minute bursts, sort of just little smaller versions of that. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. What else would you like to know or not know? Did you <laughs> try to think? You met Grappelli. Did you meet Grappelli? Yes. Yeah. And the, the, more, the more time goes on, the more sort of, um, uh, you know, pivotal that moment seems. Although actually uh -huh. it was a tiny little moment at, at, at the time sure. it happened. It was 1976 and Dad took us along to a gig and uh, Stefan was playing. Mm -hmm. um, and... We went into Dad just boldly as he would. You know, he's, he's quite a determined fellow. Took us up to his dressing room mm -hmm. and uh, knocked on the door. And Grappelli opened the door, went in, and we said, "He said, hello, how are you?'" And I said, "Oh, my 
name's Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was saying, yes, he's, he's learned to play the violin and all, all this. And, and I'm thinking, am I? You know, what's going on? Mm. And I had started then, but... Yeah. Um, I think I understand the situation more now, the adult, than I did at the time. Mm -hmm. I've got his autograph, and I remember him patting me on the head and wishing me good luck with everything. Yeah. But the, the, the best thing about that night, I remember, well, musically, was uh, the second half. He didn't come on with his violin, he came and sat down at the piano. Yeah. And he played blistering jazz piano for He's about amazing. 20 minutes. He was amazing. Without any accompaniment. Yeah. And then, of course, now I know, having read and learnt a bit more about him. Yeah. It, that was his love. His piano was yeah. his first instrument. Yeah. And violin, as he used to say on a regular basis, piano is my love and violin is my gimmick. Yeah. And it's laughable, you know, because, of course, his, his reputation is it's as a violinist. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, his piano playing was just sublime. And as far as I'm aware, there's, there's only one recording of him on piano, or just solely piano. It's called My Other Love. Mm -hmm. And it came out at the end of the 80s, I think, on EMI. Yeah, and, but you put that on, and, and if you don't see the cover, yeah. it could easily be Art Tatum or somebody like that, yeah. or Errol Garner. Yeah, it's just it is crazy. Wonderful, it? wonderful. And John Etheridge, who I've done a lot of work with over the years, who used to work with Grappelli. Yeah, he always repeats a story about how Grappelli would have a bit of Art Tatum that he loved so much at recording. Mm -hmm. Art Tatum, he'd play it over and over and over again to himself, and he would never, never lose. Uh, interest in this one little section yeah. of piano playing. Go, listen to this baby, this amazing. Listen again, listen again. Yeah. So I think I think um, I don't know quite how he uh, would describe violin as his gimmick. Yeah. But he 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 was he was relatively ungracious about the violin as as a as a thing. He was, he was more into it. music, Rapelli. Yeah. See, I think when he plays the violin, he's he, he's wonderful. Yeah. And we all know his violin playing and, you know, the recorded history is there from 1930s right up to the mid-90s when he died. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, in fact, I think he's the most recorded musician, not High Fitz, but anyway. Yeah, um, I've heard that. Maybe I've heard his that. His discography is miles long. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, he, yeah, piano, he would, he would always stop and get a much more sort of romantic and nostalgic about piano if it was mentioned. Yeah. In fact, I saw a funny video on someone posted up on online the other day on a Parkinson show, their second appearance with Menuhin, oh, and yeah. he's playing the electric piano with Menuhin. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's quite odd, but but nice yeah. piece he wrote for for Menuhin. Yeah. It was Menuhin was in awe of Grappelli. Yeah, absolutely in awe. It was amazing what he did, stepping out of his comfort zone, yeah. going right over to Grappelli's pole, and um, you know, sort of frightening himself, silly. Been j playing in a jazz environment, but yeah. being game for it. And yeah. Talking about people playing classical mm -hmm. music, getting, getting into the jazz thing. Yeah, sure. But, but yeah. Going for it. But but so talking about Grappelli, there's never been a more effortless and more fluent um, player on on the violin. I don't think there's been a few who have who have sort of been similar. Yeah. But I think the reason uh, Grappelli is so important is because he never took himself too seriously. Yeah. Sure. And uh, he would be open to playing with anyone as well. And yeah. uh, but but he would r maintain his own integrity as a, as, a, mm -hmm. as a soulful artist. I've got recordings of him playing with people like Gary Burton, yeah. with Paul Simon, Ravi Shankar, <clears throat> yeah. as well as the ones with Django Reinhardt, and there's mm -hmm. some wonderful stuff with George Shearing in the 50s, mm -hmm. British piano player. And he's every single uh, example, he, he's still recognisable as Grappelli. Yeah, sure. Completely just... Loves playing music and yeah. sharing music with people. One the other day I saw I hadn't seen before with um, McCoy Tyner. Yeah. And the oh, yeah, it's the, great. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. He's, so he's just one of these human beings which happen, he happens to play the violin and so on. But I think he was, he's just um, got the right attitude to, yeah. to things, music, life, people in general. Yeah. Which um, really appealed to me. And so I think um, whilst there are lots of other people who play jazz or played jazz on the violin there's something about Grappelli's attitude and uh, the way he um, uh, he, he present, presented himself yeah. which I think is a great example of how to be Yeah. not taking yourself too seriously I think that, uh, largely that can, that can be a hurdle which people put up for themselves which actually limits their potential yeah yeah, yeah I agree yeah it's, uh, I think it's quite hard people do take themselves very seriously uh huh 
Another violin player that I heard young, which I always recommend people listen to, less well known, but of course is Stuff Smith. Oh yeah. Um, you know, using the heel yeah. much more than Grappelli, who you tended to play down the tip of the bow yeah. more. Um, Stuff Smith, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, other influences on the fiddle, as I mentioned, El Shankar earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and some early Jean-Luc Ponty I really liked. Oh yeah. Where he's in his whole Coltrane period. The playing uh, without, jazz long playing. Yeah, and playing without any vibrato, you know, yeah. and really kind of drying the whole sound out, and playing yeah. very flat, sort of almost emotionless, but yeah. through doing it that way, making it, you know, sort of really emotional. Yeah. A beautiful recording of You've Changed in the mid 60s on that album, Sunday Walk. I don't know that. A live album, Sunday, Sunday Walk. Walk. It's don't amazing, know. yeah. It wasn't so um, uh, uh, um, excited about some of Jean-Luc's electric stuff from the 70s, but, um, the but cool. Um, and then Didier Lockwood a little bit, yeah. important figure. Yeah. He kind of took the baton from Jean-Luc, I think, and yeah. um, developed a very efficient, fast way of playing bop yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, other players... He just died. I really he? like Yeah, He died not that long ago. That really, suddenly, yeah. That, that was, was quite really shocking. Shock. Uh-huh. Um, other players on the fiddle? Hmm. Well, there are lots of... No one else. But, well, obviously, Joe Venuti mm. and Eddie South, some of the, some of the other early, early guys are, are special for different reasons. Yeah. Joe Venuti is a good one for sort of bridging the gap from straight style playing to jazz style playing, some mm -hmm. of those things with Eddie Lang. Yeah. Um, a really nice way in for uh, classical students wanting to you know, cross the, the gap. Although I don't like to think of it as a gap so much, it's just a, um, an, a sort of um, imaginary gap. It's definitely, it's music is yeah. all, all music is music. It's um, yeah. breaking down barriers in your mind um, rather than there being a jazz camp and a classical camp yeah. or, or you know different yeah. camps. Yeah. <clears throat> it's about making a sound together. Sure. And so I think it's more about ensemble playing in the end. You know, let's not have the conductor, let's just all sit and listen. Yeah. Set up, set up a groove. And sometimes I go to the academy or the college in London here and we do workshops with yeah. the, string, the first year strings. And um, that's what we do, we set up a little groove and they're all rabbit in the headlights to begin with. But yeah. within five minutes they're all going, oh, hang on, no, this, yeah, this is cool. Yeah. There's only a couple of chords here, maybe just one chord. Yeah. We'll take a South African thing, maybe a, a dollar brand um, thing, township vibe right, yeah. thing, and set that up. <clears throat> and but within five or ten minutes, most of the room is having a little go at improvising. Yeah, <clears throat> straight away, and then maybe introduce something a little bit, a little bit more sophisticated mm -hmm. after that. So bit by bit, you know, these eighteen, nineteen, twenty-year-olds find that yeah, it's uh, you know, really, really not that far removed from yeah. anything I already know. I can already got more than enough technique to. Um, because we're staying in first position by and large. Yeah. Not doing anything at the dusty end. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Do you find people? So you you actually you find people generally well classical musicians can, after, you know, five minutes get into that way of thinking. Definitely. Uh, I'm always approached by people in recording sessions or at the colleges, um, and then professionally um, out on tour, um, who have figured out for themselves that. You know, like something they might like to try, even if yeah. they've already had a 10, 20 year long career, so they might be in their 30s or 40s already. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> they want to go on a little voyage of discovery. Yeah. And then, yeah, just showing them how you can break up a, a scale into patterns, yeah. for example. Yeah. Something as simple as that. Yeah. Not just an arpeggio, but using a pentatonic or a tetratonic scale. Yeah. And then how you can use the violin, of course, expressively, which mm -hmm. is something that. Um, Maybe we take for granted, but you can do all these incredible things with glissando, double yeah. stops, pizzicato, yeah. all these things which yeah. can't do so much on yeah. saxophones and trumpets, and they do their own effects. But mm -hmm. there's so many expressive um, aspects to string instruments, fretless yeah. instruments, yeah. and uh, that we can employ when we play jazz material mm -hmm. to make it. I mean, thinking of El Shankar's style of playing, yeah. for example, all that one finger stuff up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it really can be a, such an expressive instrument if you're sensible with it. I mm -hmm. think one of the big pitfalls and biggest crimes of a lot of people improvising in, in on violin 
viola cello is never ever taking the bow away from the damn strings mm -hmm. and it's really frustrating because of course uh, I think we don't have to take the horn out of our mouths obviously mm -hmm. so you just don't have that barrier there but the music can suffer as a result if you don't yeah. put those um, rests like we were saying about practice earlier about phrasing yeah um, so one of the first things I try and encourage people to do is to, for goodness sake, put some punctuation in your, mm -hmm. uh, with, between your ideas. Yeah. You know, have a little um, think about um, the listener. Give mm -hmm. them a chance to soak up what you're um, performing for them. Use bebop as a really, really good source mm -hmm. for that, that rule. All of Parker's tunes are broken up beautifully into um, yeah. attack, sustain, and release, or attack, tension, and release. Mm -hmm. But it be do do that. But but it be do do that. But 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 do that. You know. Whereas, of course, the opposite end of the violin playing uh, world would be, say, Irish folk music, Celtic yeah. music. Yeah. Great for that. You know, that's where that is. You know, yeah. the way it all. Um, threads together that's yeah. part of the fa fabric of that that world but if you do that in a jazz context there's no room for anything else to happen mm -hmm. yeah so um i'd say to some people students of mine if they ever um seem to be leaning towards that and not taking the bar off the strings please have a listen to um mars davis yeah have a listen to um, various whoever you yeah. care to mention and just listen to what they're doing with space in fact just yesterday one of people I teach down at the uh, Guildhall transcribed um, some uh, miles playing round midnight He's, mm -hmm. and he, he'd done a great transcription and he said he was amazed how when he put the bow to the string to play what he transcribed yeah how in that moment even though he'd been listening to it and transcribed it for hours yeah writing it down when he actually started playing it, yeah. you couldn't believe how much space there was between yeah. each phrase. We, we have to remember how important it is to to use space yeah. as a device to to make our ideas more coherent. Yeah, yeah, that's um, really what I'm trying to get at, and what I'm getting at there. And people like Parker and Miles and Herbie Hancock, <clears throat> all our favourite musicians, or certainly some of mine, they um, that's great source material for seeing what. I'm talking about there. Yeah. But of course on the violin side, again, Grappelli, mm -hmm. um, of course there's plenty of examples of him playing without very much space in his solos. Grappelli, <laughs> it yeah. Sounds yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah. So I guess what I'm talking about more is a, a more contemporary style of playing. Yeah, sure. Um, but then of course I've just remembered um, his recording, Grappelli's recording with Gary Burton, Paris mm -hmm. Encounter. Yeah. And for example on there, Blue and Green. Yeah. And he does use a bit of space, you know, yeah. so he kind of was, he was that sort of musician. He would just sort of adapt to different musical environments just yeah. so naturally. I but think he used An space. early version of Undecided with Django Reinhardt, it would be like... Yeah, yeah. Which is wonderful, of course. Yeah. So, and, that, and it serves the purpose there. Because, of course, you've got endless... Yeah. And something that Kelly knows a little bit about is coming back into the room. Yeah. Runkle Chunkle. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, as I started off saying, involved in a variety of different things musically, which is what keeps me going. It's the variety, is the spice of music and yeah. life and the rest of it. Um, sing with Jackie Dankworth, Butterfly's Wing. Yeah. I do a duet with David Gordon, the pianist. Mm -hmm. and we touch on all sorts of different musical yeah. um, subjects. Um, play a lot with the Budapest Cafe Orchestra still, yeah. just re releasing a ninth CD. Mm -hmm. And I love that because that's a real hybrid um, of all my musical tastes put together. Yeah. It's a little, you know, it's sort of essentially based around Balkan folk music and Russian folk music, wow, but yeah. we don't really exclusively want to do anything um, authentic about it. We okay, like yeah. to take elements of it. Yeah. So we're not trying to do transcriptions of yeah. our favourite recordings of San Sandor Lakatos or. Yeah of the um, Budapest, um, any of the Budapest orchestras. We're, we like a good melody, so we'll mm -hmm. take that, and, and we happen to play a lot of the same instruments as you find there. Mm -hmm. um, double bass, accordion, violin, and um, domra, saz, guitar, mm. dabuka, yeah. tambourine. But um, 
we'll find a good melody and do our own thing with it use, using um, ideas from jazz, from film music, from yeah. um, other parts of the world. We'll play Gaelic folk music from Scotland. Yeah. We'll play um, a bit of John Barry. Mm-hmm. And we mix it all together and call it the Budapest Cafe Orchestra. It's, yeah. it's a lot of fun, it's light-hearted, and, and by and large cl- crowds really seem to enjoy the, the show. Yeah. Um, and again, we don't take it too seriously, you yeah. know, for goodness sake. We take the music seriously enough to play it well, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. No. So really enjoy that. Um, and there's jazz and improvisation at times during performances for Budapest Cafe Orchestra. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a plan to re- record a wonderful piece that I was um, fort- fortunate enough to have written for me by John Dankworth, mm-hmm. a jazz violin concerto. Oh, wow. And... Uh, combine that on a record with something that my dad, Michael Garrick, wrote many years ago for, uh, again, Nigel Kennedy to play. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so this sort of jazz violin concerto thing, but this sort of small suite that he mm-hmm. wrote called At Home mm-hmm. for Nigel. And um, try and find some funding to um, record that with yeah. the orchestra. And, uh, oh, that'd be cool. Both pieces are orchestrated uh, with a, a, a jazz group at the centre, quartet, mm-hmm. piano bass drums mm-hmm. in the middle of it. So try and get that together soon. And then continue teaching at the Royal College, Royal Academy and the Guildhall in London. Mm-hmm. And a little bit of private on as well. Um, and um, uh, I just love participating in, in music. Um, jazz violin as a, as a sort of subject is not something I uh, tend to separate off from anything else it's all part of one big picture for me sure. in my mind it's um when i speak to uh <clears throat> people learning jazz jazz violin how to improvise i always encourage them to go and transcribe something but not necessarily a violin player yeah sure go and pick an improvisation by keith jarrett or by somebody that you've heard doesn't need necessarily to be violin mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there's two main reasons that's useful first of all the language they're using on on their particular instrument, piano, guitar, drum, saxophone, trumpet, is you know, going to be suited to that instrument. And so by applying it, putting it on, on the fingerboard, it's really going to stretch your technique totally. for, one, for one thing and your thinking. Yeah. It just broadens your uh, you know, experience and in, will inform you even more about what yeah. um, you can incorporate, what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so I think of it, it as music making <clears throat> rather than the violin as a jazz instrument yeah. um, and so I'm not too bogged down with the jazz violin the thing violin. So, yeah. so much you yeah. know um, as I say I always wanted to be a drummer so yeah. um, I tend to play quite percussively on, yeah. if I get the chance we have every three months or so we do a Saturday night down at the 606 in right, yeah. London and we really let our hair down I mm-hmm. get the pedals out I get yeah. the electric violin and um, play some very loud sort of mm-hmm. headhunter stuff. We do yeah. actual proof Herbie Hancock yeah, yeah. thing, and then the next minute we might play a really nice, sumptuous, gentle ballad like Touch Your Soft Lips and Part, yeah, yeah. and um, everything in between. And we really have a great time, a lot of originals, and uh, do a lot of looping, yeah. with rhythmic stuff with looping, mm-hmm. with the electric fiddle, and duetting with Tom Hooper, the drummer I've been working with for such yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So you like, to, you like, you like rhythm? I do have a I have soft spot. That. I, have, I do have a soft spot for rhythm. I've and noticed I've, that in your in your playing when I've listened to you play. I've noticed that you've got you'll sort of throw the the accents around. Mm, I I just love the, what the Indians do with their yeah. tea highs. Yeah, I did a bit of that actually. Yeah. Yeah. And all, all the yeah. Yeah. All the stuff like. From Shak- Shakti onwards, and I got more interested in what the tabla players were doing. Yeah. Um, so studied that a little bit, and then we had uh, fortunate enough at the academy to have lots of wonderful people come and talk to us, um, arranged by the wonderful leader of the course, now departed Graham Collier, mm-hmm. and uh, a chap from Banff in Canada who used to come over all the time. Wonderful, wonderful musician and teacher Hugh Fraser mm-hmm. and between them they used to get in people um, to talk to us and one of them was this Irish bass player called Ronan Guilfoyle mm-hmm. and he wrote Ronan uh, wrote this wonderful book which I bought all about um, odd meters yeah. and uh, how you can apply 
uh, rhythmic ideas over regular time signatures three and four yeah time. and he had his band with him uh, and they performed for us mm -hmm. and it was just spellbinding how he'd um, got his head around it yeah and I learned a lot from reading his book and then he uh, another day for example Steve Coleman would come in say mm -hmm. uh, with his M bass group yeah it just seemed to be people that were at Ronnie's that week mm -hmm. and Hugh or Graham or somebody would get in touch with them and say, what are you doing today? Because obviously they're not on at Ronnie's until 10 at night. Yeah. And Dave Holland came in one day. We had Jack DeJohnette come in. Mm. We had um, uh, Kenny Wheeler. Oh, yeah. Um, we had Chucho, we had, uh, Chucho Valdez mm -hmm. from Irakire. Yeah. Um, we had Arturo Sandoval, mm -hmm. again from Irakire. Um Gary Peacock came in another occasion. Yeah. My goodness, he, he likes to talk about harmony. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah, yeah that was mine numbingly. <laughs> <laughs> Harmonic, that lecture. So it was an incredible uh, fertile period for everybody down at the academy. Um, yeah. Very exciting. So rhythmic, yeah, a lot of uh, interesting things about rhythm, which I really, really got into big time on mm -hmm. the academy Right, yeah. jazz course yeah 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 and started coming into my writing all the time mm -hmm. although i would play um hot club music mm -hmm. you know more sort of i guess mainstream jazz file and stuff i did less and less of it while i was there i got much more into yeah um odd times and mm -hmm. uh, odd meters and yeah playing electric violin um looping mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. mucking around with those ideas yeah yeah mm -hmm. Do you in, do you enjoy that more than the sort of older stuff, the hot club stuff, or you just is it? I think what I enjoy is having the uh, variety now. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I could do with a little bit more of the the uh, odd time wacky stuff than right. I do at the moment. Yeah. But um, I do enough of it, I just about yeah. to keep things ticking yeah. over. Um, so in, in equal amounts, I think it's about having the mix. Yeah. If yeah. I did more of one than the other, then I'd get quickly bored of mm -hmm. of of, uh, of that you know what yeah. miss the other thing you know yeah. it's yeah. like we were saying earlier at the beginning about food you know sort of mix and match all the yeah. time and yeah it might be a sort of french thing or italian thing a spanish thing or, yeah. or eastern or thai yeah vibe and chinese it's as long as you get a little you don't miss one thing for too long yeah 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 because once you've had the taste of something really good you kind of remember it don't you and you yeah. sort of go oh actually what about oh it's been a while let's let's do um you know, a seafood paella. We haven't had one of them yeah. for a couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you go, oh yeah, that is as good as I remember it. So, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so on and so forth. The same with music. Yeah. You know, there's a chord. And you go, oh, what's that lovely voicing? You know, that sort of Lydian dominant thing with the root on top. Yeah. Cool, I haven't heard that for a bit. Mm. It's just the fact the root's right up there on top rather than mm -hmm. underneath. Mm -hmm. You go, hmm, why have we overlooked that? Let's make sure we use that a little bit more often you okay know? yeah so there's some more exotic things which don't necessarily register or get lodged in place yeah harmonically rhythmically um melodically yeah, yeah. so it's really important to take stock of things mm -hmm. um that's why transcription is so important mm -hmm. i transcribe something every week still and oh cool and okay. sit down at the piano and work out what on earth is going on with the harmony which doesn't right. look like it is in the real book or it's so different from yeah, another yeah. recording yeah and um, really take a lot of pride in doing that. So you transcribe time, songs or you'll transcribe solos? Everything. Or just something, anything? Yeah, just something, right. yeah. anything, anything. If I find some material, whether it's um, something, some Beethoven or yeah. some Mahler or it could be something from Hungary, it could mm -hmm. be something from anywhere really, yeah. some Gallic folk music, um, a, a rare bebop recording, bootleg, that mm -hmm. I haven't heard before that someone's yeah. just posted up on YouTube, of maybe a tune that I'm already familiar with, but there could be something about that certain performance which that uh, I hadn't heard before, mm -hmm. uh, that hadn't occurred to me before, it, but had happened on that um, uh, that day, and someone happened to record it, and you go, shit, what's, what's going on there? Yeah. So you get get the pen and paper and the piano, and you go, oh, yeah, that's what it is. It's sort of like what I understood before, but there's that voicing is just slightly different, so it creates a slightly different tension in there. Yeah. And it's focusing on those little nuances Mm. which keeps, you know, life interesting. Yeah. Because it's, everything isn't the same, everything's changing all the time, everything's fluid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, although you think um, <clears throat> of, of life as being a bit episodic, a bit repetitious, yeah. actually, there are those little nuances and, you know, uh, relationships you have in, in every way, between people, between instruments, between ingredients, mm -hmm. it just never fails to fascinate me. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. That's a nice way of looking at it.
yeah it's great just keep an open mind yeah uh, it's also probably a good place to stop I think I can hear people I thought you were going to ask me what strings I use or something like that that's what strings that. do you use that's not a very interesting question Matthew oh, <laughs> not using for Astro um, what's it uh, either Parazzi gold anymore because they keep going wrong I've, really? they're really expensive and the A string keeps unwinding itself like oh really yeah. well, how, how quickly after a few days putting it on and oh, I keep really? having to send them back get, get refund or replacements yeah so I'm not quite sure have you got any recommendations I just I mean I, I spent ages just using the, the standard dominance because I was poor and then I recently went back to using obligatos, and I think my yeah. violin needs obligatos because it's I like a very, obligatos. They're good. It's sort of it, they're very thick sounding, mm -hmm. and they're quite. I don't know. I, I do like them. I, I do like them a lot. So yeah, that's my. That's what I use. Mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna sort of stick to it. And try them again. I used to use the obligatos. But the gold E is good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Although I found they break. Mm, they tend they to break. break for me. Yeah. And I. I've, I've stuck with the the gold label E. Oh, right. Don't, don't know which it. are cheaper, but uh, they're less breakable, I find. Right. Have you used Some Hill? Up. Hill E's are pretty have, good. In yeah, fact, if, in I'm, the past. if I uh, if I'm going for it, I'll get Obligatus with a Hill E. Right. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> That's the ultimate setup. For me, anyway. I'll tell you what's been a revelation for me recently is this Chorus bow hair. Right. comes so from this? France. Right. It's uh, synthetic bow okay. hair. And it's um, saved me two thousand pounds a year. Oh really? Yeah, on bow rehairs. What is it? Don't tell anyone. Okay. <laughs> no, tell everyone. It's uh, <clears throat> it's being developed in France, I think, and the Chamber Orchestra of Toulouse, the string section, exclusively used this chorus bow hair. Really? And so I thought oh, I was worth checking out. Check Got to get out, some yeah. of this stuff. And string is up in Edinburgh, which I use. Oh yeah, no, string is all yeah. the time. They sold me a no. Yeah, on. They uh, said, yeah, we've got some chorus here. Would you like to try some? And uh, and I said, great. He, they said, it's, um, it comes in any colour. What colour would you like? Yeah. And I said, I think I'll just go for plain white, please. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> so you can get it in any, any, any colour? Any colour you want. Crazy. Uh, rainbow colours. Um, so I tried it, and they sold it to me with some synthetic rosin. And I tried, and it wouldn't work, the synthetic rosin. I thought, oh, no, what's... Anyway, I, I didn't give up. I put on normal rosin. That mm -hmm. did go on fine. Yeah. Normal, t traditional rosin. Yeah. And I've never looked back. Really? I haven't broken a single damn okay. hair on it. Right. And so I've got doesn't four break. of them. Seems. It doesn't break. It's unbreakable. And not I'll only that, it, it doesn't wear. It doesn't seem to wear out. Yeah. I've been using the same one for about six months now. Yeah. And you can clean All it. All right. I mean, I use bow hair. I, I keep bow hair for a long time. All right. I don't know. Well, you. I shouldn't do. I should. All, I should get rehaired more regularly, but. I just don't. Well, the opposite usually went for me when I get through the bowhead too quickly because right. playing with um, some bands that I work with, getting the energy gets going it's so loud. Yeah. You, you're attacking it so much that it starts breaking. Of course, as we know, once it starts breaking, it's, it, all goes, it keeps yeah. going, keeps yeah. going forever. But so the synthetic bowhead for live work um, is absolute revelation. Right. Chorus it try it out. is one of, of, of several different manufacturers. You have to find someone who's It's been who good so far. You have to find someone who's happy to use it. I imagine there's a lot of luthiers who are, oh no, we don't use that stuff, we just use our stuff. Well, stringers are okay uh, doing it. Um, right. I wouldn't use it for recording sessions because the, you do get a little uh, extra edge to the sound, uh -huh. um, which is audible on right. the mic. Right. If especially if it's quite, uh, some quiet recording, okay. so I, I keep a, you know, a sort of bona fide Pernambuco mm -hmm. nice horse head, horse head bow for those occasions. Right. Okay. For your Abbey Road things, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which are few and far between, but still happen. Yeah. And um, but uh, live work, I swear by it now. It's a revelation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Got money saved and expenses. I've got to try that out. Um, was I going to say something? You made I had I had something to ask you that came from the the bow hair thing. It came from the bow hair. It's probably it's gone. It's gone. Should we leave it there? It's done. Yeah. Nice, nice one, nice. one, man. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Good, good to good. see you. Yeah. You have been listening to the Jazz Violin Podcast. I've been Matt Holborn, and I've been chatting to Chris Garrick today. Um, please subscribe to us on iTunes or whichever way you find your podcasts. We're pretty much everywhere now. Um, yeah, 
We have some more guests lined up. Uh, nothing confirmed just yet, but some really, really cool ones in the pipeline. I'm really excited. Um, yeah, see you later. Thank you.